Well, it's, it's, it's important for, for, for several reasons. First, it is not actually such a consensus in the literature that that's the case. You can tell stories, of course, why that should be true. Unequal countries, that's to say countries with unequal income. You know, often political power is more evenly distributed than that. And so one would expect the, the societies to come up with ways to redistribute that income. There are a number of reasons to think that that might not be true. First of all, if you're, well, depending on how cynical are, you are, you, 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 you probably don't think it's uh, one person, one vote, even in a democracy. Sometimes people talk about one dollar, one vote. So it's, for example, you know, Stiglitz talks a lot about this in his 2012 book. And, and, and insofar as that effect is powerful, that's to say that, that the, the richer people have more political influence, it's not obvious how that's going to work out. But another, another feature is that it's, since it's been hard to measure redistribution, people have had trouble identifying this effect empirically. They do things like they try and look at the relationship between, between inequality and the size of the state as a proxy for redistribution or, or uh, uh, the size of the amount of taxation or the amount of subsidies as a, as a, as a proxy for redistribution. But we know that many of those things are poor measures of redistribution. In many countries in the world, education spending is regressive. It mostly goes to tertiary or even, in some poor countries, secondary education, which mainly benefits the better off, for example. So we don't have a, it's not been easy to find, to, to, clear, to, to, to look directly at this question about redistribution and inequality. And, and Branko Milanovic, in some earlier work, has shown that when you measure both sides pretty well, you, you tend to see that relationship. And it's a pretty powerful effect on the whole. At least, especially in the OECD, most of the differences between OECD countries in market inequality are undone, if you want, by the tax and transfer system. More than half, as, a, as an average matter. So, for example, you know, you can ask, the U.S. is an outlier in, the, in that it is very, in, among the rich countries, it's quite unequal in terms of net income inequality. Some of that is because of it's relatively unequal in market uh, income, but most of it is because for a country of its degree of market inequality, it redistributes relatively little. So it's kind of an outlier in redistribution more than it is an outlier in, in market inequality. So this, this was the, the, the central question we looked at in, in our initial paper was, was what what is the story about the relationship between inequality and growth? And in particular, you could tell various stories about the relationship between inequality and growth. Many people have argued that inequality is a necessary condition for growth and that more inequality probably leads to more growth. For example, in unequal countries, rich people get more of the money and they probably save and invest more. So that should lead to more growth. Uh, and there are other stories you can tell kind of like that. Other people have argued that that for various reasons, inequality should be, could be associated with low growth. In unequal societies, poor people are going to have less access to health and education. And we know from all sorts of micro evidence that health and education can be good investments or are generally good investments. And, and you know, cap, as we, sometimes this is labeled credit market imperfections, which sounds awfully clinical. But it's a very general situation in which if you're a poor person, you tend not to be able to kind of finance good investments in health and education. It just doesn't happen. And, and, and uh, so you underinvest. And, and so that's a reason why inequality could, could hurt growth. There are other reasons. Inequality could cause political instability, and political instability could be bad for investment. Inequality can make it, it's argued by people like Danny Roderick, that inequality can make it hard for countries to generate the, the consensus required to adjust to difficult times. This is an argument that was really uh, uh, asserted strongly back in the last round of crises in the, in the 80s, in the se late 70s and early 80s, when it was observed that more equal countries seemed to be able to roll with the punches of those, of those shocks back then. You know, inter world interest rates went way up. Oil prices shot up. Countries got into problems with external debt. Many of them did. Some countries managed to raise revenues, cut spending, adjust, and keep growth going. Others could not, they continued to borrow until, until they couldn't, and then they had to work their way over a decade or more out of a, a debt problem. And one of the differentiating factors 
seems to some people to have been inequality, which, which makes it hard for people to get together and make, which arguably makes it hard for societies to make decisions that are in the benefit of everyone, but which may hurt some people more than others. In other words, is it, you know, should society, people in, the, in a political system, for example, can spend time arguing about how to divide the pie, or they can try and make the pie bigger. And in a very unequal society, it may be more fruitful in the narrow sense to worry about the division of the pie. And so equality sets the stage maybe for better reactions. Now that's a generalization. Of course, political systems are different. Countries are different. This is only a broad generalization. But those are the kind of ideas that were out there that we were trying to test. So we looked at the data. We tried to say, when countries are more equal, do their growth booms last longer? Is their growth rate higher in subsequent periods? Once you control for the standard determinants of growth. And we found, indeed, that this is, this is really a salient result. That's to say it's a, it's a result that comes out, doesn't matter too much which sample you use, what other variables you put in the regression. It seems to be a relatively strong uh, result. It is almost hard to believe, in a way, uh, as it is a, it is a very strongly held view that, 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 that redistribution must be bad for growth. Because we, we, we tend to think about certain mechanisms. We tend to think about the, the disincentive effects of higher taxation. But there are plenty of other mechanisms out there that matter as well. We know that, 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 there's, that there's underinvestment in, in health and education because poor people don't have resources to, 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 to do that kind of thing. We know that people who lose time uh, or, or get sick with, uh, with malaria have, they can have very long-lasting or permanent effects on their lifetime income, productivity and incomes. And, and there are any number of, of mechanisms like that. And, and so it, it, in the end, it's kind of an empirical question. It is a partly empirical question as to whether when we see the countries have redistributed more, which effects have really dominated. In, in the data, that's to say, have these disincentive effects been so bad or have the resulting uh, positive effects of, uh, of their lower inequality over, uh, been, 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 been overwhelmed that effect? And what we find in the data is we find very little evidence that countries that redistribute more, once you control for inequality now, the countries that redistribute more seem to have worse growth performances. We just don't see it. If all you do is plot on a picture, how much a country redistributes against growth over the next five or ten years. There's no obvious pattern. So it's kind of a simple observation that countries that redistribute more don't seem to grow slower. They don't seem to grow faster particularly or slower. Of course, there's a lot of variation. And all our fancy statistics does is try and see, does that basic picture hold up when you control for all sorts of things? Does it hold up when you control for initial income, when you control for inequality itself, when you try and use statistical techniques to tease out the direction of causation and things like that. We find it, it holds up. And so, you know, I think it's a fact or it's a, it's a result that people should, that should cause people to think. It doesn't mean those finance ministers should go out and raise taxes uh, tomorrow uh, from whatever they are, 25% to 50%. It certainly does not mean that. It means that they should think twice, though, before, before assuming that that kind of thing is the, is the wrong way to proceed. I was struck today with the talk by the uh, minister from Brazil about how they've had tremendous success at, at, uh, at redistributing, have really huge positive results for, for the, the standard of living of most of the people in the country, for equality, and, and for many uh, uh, social indicators, but that average growth, mean growth, has, has slowed. And he was expressing some concern that, that that there was this growth trade-off. And what, what struck me, not thinking really about Brazil specifically, was the question of whether, had they not engaged in that redistributive policy, would they have had a backlash, a political backlash, that would have undermined the growth that they have had, which after all is positive, is not bad. It's not fantastic, but it's, it's not bad. And, and one could imagine, had they stayed at that terribly high level of inequality that they had in the, uh, when they started this this sort of new policy, it might not have been a sustainable uh, growth episode at all, uh, which suggests that maybe the trade-off isn't as obvious, even in, in that case, as, as some might see it. That doesn't mean they don't need to work on 
making more efficient their system of redistribution and, 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 and doing structural reforms that will promote growth. Of course they do. But I think it, it does maybe put that, that thinking in, in, in a slightly different context. Well, I would love to have an interesting new paper, quicker than three years this time. We are looking at, at, at a number of things, but I hesitate to say specifically because we have to see what turns out to work. I think that, you know, what's, what's, what one thing we would like to do is, is work more on, on the mechanisms, understand better the mechanisms that link, that link uh, equality and growth. In a way, our papers leave us with a puzzle. I explain, there are many possible mechanisms linking inequality and growth. Some of them we ought to have observed. For example, if inequality leads to low investment because of political instability, then when you look at the effects of inequality and investment on growth, inequality shouldn't matter anymore. If it's working through investment, then when you put investment into the relationship, that should kind of pick up the effects of inequality. In other words, unequal countries should have low investment, and, that should, and therefore that will be picked up in the investment term. We don't see that. When we put in investment, we put in education, we still get an effect of inequality on top of the, it's the way it may be working through those variables. So that is a puzzle. Now, it could be that the answer is that inequality works in, in a lot of different ways, and it works different ways in different circumstances. And so it's kind of hard for it to pick it up with a couple of other variables. But it, it raises questions we, we want to look at. Another thing I would like to do, and we're working on it, is to try and link is to try and look more carefully at country-specific contexts and link better inequality and macro policies. We are at the IMF, after all. And a, a question that we would like to be able to answer better than we do is about the relationship between, between not just fiscal policies, but, but policies that have an effect on, say, the real exchange rate, or even monetary policy and, 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 and distribution. And, 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 we'd and I think the only way to do that, really, is in a kind of country-specific context in which we look at micro data, we look at macro data, and we have a kind of theoretical structure that allows us to map them back and forth, and we can think about the relationship between macro policies and, and, and distribution. That may not be the most important drivers of distribution or of redistribution. You know, most of it may be longer term structural change and things like that. But as the IMF, we, we need to worry about this, these kind of macroeconomic factors. And we've been working on that for a couple of years. We have one or two working papers, but it's, 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 it's been hard to make progress because it's, it's basically a hard analytic problem. We've got some support from the UK's uh, Department for International Development that's allowing us to pursue that analytic project over a relatively long horizon. I hope we'll make progress on that. Well, it's, it's been striking to me in the last uh, day of this conference how useful this, this really is. First of all, we use uh, UN-wider data. The WID, the, the World in Income Inequality Database produced by WIDER, is what is at the base of the data that we use for our work. But beyond that, you know, I took tons of notes today about things we want to pursue as we go home and, and, and things we can bring, to the, bring back and, 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 uh, and try and pursue. I think uh, it's hard to keep up with what's going on around, and a conference like this really... Uh, opens uh, eyes to all the, different, the many different f features of what's going on. You know, we, we tend to look at our own little piece. We all tend to look at our own little piece of the puzzle. So it's, and one thing about this conference that's really striking is on the one hand, you have uh, a lot, some big picture kind of topics about measurement of global and global, the value of global databases. And then you have kind of uh, inequality in Rwanda or the role of food price volatility for inequality in, in Togo or something like that, which is, and I think it's great to get both kinds of, uh, uh, all these different kinds of work in one place.